today we're going to be focusing on a very interesting data set which has um, a lot of a lot of say parameters so our data set today it's it's the it's a it's a data set from UCI is it UCI yeah University of California and um, basically it's it's it contains a lot of data for uh, breast cancer patients like it's actually real data that was taken back in the uh, the late, uh, I think the 1990s there about, like late, like close to 2000. And we have 569 points, right, from uh, that many patients. And there are 30 different parameters, right? So like when I say parameters, like if you think about like, a regular graph, you have an X, Y graph, right? For that, we only have um, one, um, we have X and we have Y, right? But in our case, we have X, we have Y, and you can think of it, we have Z, we have A, B, C, D, all the way up to 30. So you can think of it as a 30 dimensional problem, right? Because if you have X, Y, that's 2D. If you have X, Y, Z, that's 3D. But in our case, we have 30 dimensions, right? So it's pretty crazy what we're gonna be doing today. Because like, when we try to talk about say even 4D to start with, like our minds literally cannot like begin to grasp it. But today we're gonna be using a machine learning to help us like analyze this 30 dimensional data set. And this is like super useful in, in, in engineering to be to be specific because like if you like if you like get a job or something and you like you're trying to anal analyze some data it, it can be super useful if you have like a lot of uh, parameters going on you could easily use it to like make predictions based on the countless parameters you have okay so let's have a brief look at like our, what our data actually entails so we have there's a bunch of stuff for like our cancer data set so what what essentially this data set contains is you think of it as like people took like a bunch of images of cancer cells and they they recorded like a bunch of like um measurements off off the images of the cancer cells so we have like the radius right we have the texture we have perimeter we have area smoothness and a bunch of other stuff right so these are just a few of them there's a lot more and yeah we're essentially going to be essentially predicting whether the given cancer cell with all these uh, random parameters, we're basically gonna be predicting whether that not that cell is is a uh, is malignant or it's benign, right? So like we have different different tumors basically, right? Everything in this data set is a tumor, but as we know, like not all tum tumors can cause damage. Some of them are benign and do like no damage, and there's the malig the mal malignant ones that lead to cancer, right? So today, what, we, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be training the AI on all these 30 parameters that we input to uh, predict whether the tumor we have is either malignant or benign. Before I go in, let me just quickly show the, uh, the expected output for the end. So you guys can have a brief idea of what we're going to be doing today. Let's open this. Give it a sec, okay. So this is like the coded file with all the code already. Like, let me just go all the way down to the end. And what we're essentially gonna be doing is we're gonna be predicting. And our main thing we're gonna be concerned with is, is our accuracy, right? Because what we're doing is we're predicting this, that is this cell malignant or is it not malignant, right? So it's, it's what we need to care about is accuracy. And in this little table over here in this output, this is after I've trained, trained all the whole neural network. And you can see that we have a 0 0.94 accuracy, which corresponds with this, right? 0 0.94, and that is a 94% accuracy. So throughout our whole data set, we can achieve a 94% accuracy, which is pretty good, right? And there's some there's some more metrics that I'll get into later about the confusion matrices and stuff like that. But yeah, essentially we're gonna be predicting whether uh, our cells are malign or, uh, sorry, malignant or benign to a pretty high accuracy still. Let's get into it. Let me open up my old notebook. <sighs> okay, so the first thing we're gonna wanna do is, well, create a new cell, but we're gonna have to uh, load in our data. But before we load in our data, let's import pandas, SPD as always, and we're gonna import NumPy as NP. Irene, do you see me like switching desktops when I like oh, switch? It just like, flashes like... a little bit, but it looks good. Oh, really? Okay, okay. Um, okay. So we're gonna do this first. 
And we're gonna create our data frame where we load in all our data, right? So let me say load data. And we're gonna save our data into a variable called, just called df, which is short for data frame. And we're gonna do pd dot read CSV, CSV. And then we want we want to put in the the text, the uh, the string name for the CSV file we're trying to read, right? And if you want to know the string name, it's literally just cancer class underscore classification dot CSV, right? So we, we want to type it in as is, as as it looks in the like as it looks in the file name, right? So cancer classification dot CSV. If you make a mistake, it's gonna have an error. So let me run this. Hopefully, it didn't misspell anything. Okay, yeah, it loaded properly, nice. So yeah, you need to spell it the exact same as it looks, else you're gonna get an error. But yeah, so we've loaded our data. Let's let's have a brief look at it. So what we can do is we can do df.head, like in our previous tutorials. And what this does is it allows us to look at the first five lines of our data set. <clears throat> okay, so we can see here, we have like, we essentially have a gigantic table, right? We have a bunch of our par parameters, right? We have, as I said earlier, we have 30 different parameters, right? Mean radius, mean texture, all this stuff over here, they add up to 30, right? There are 30 separate parameters. And what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to predict whether this output over here, this very last column is either malignant or, or, or benign, where benign is represented by zero and malignant is represented by one, right? So let me let me show like a larger set. Let me just do df, and we should be able to see a few ones which have an output of one. Okay, so if you come over here, for instance, if you go to this line, which line is that? Line, the very last line, 568. If you go all the way to the end, you can see that the label for this section, the line, like the, the very last column says one, right? Which means that this cell over here is, 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 is a cancer cell. So this is basically like our whole data set. We're yet to split it. We're yet to uh, do any data prep. There's just like the raw data that was collected by scientists, right? So we as like uh, machine learning engineers, what we have to do is our first step is to basically prepare the data for the machine learning model, right? So actually before we do that, one thing we have to do is we have to like it's it's not something you, you must do, but I highly recommend that you do is you, you want you want to try to uh, visualize your data to help yourself to understand it. What do I mean by visualize your data? You want to essentially create a bunch of graphs that help that help you like understand like or have like a broad a broader uh, understanding of of what the data is. Okay, so one thing we're gonna do is we're gonna import Seaborn, which is our data Seaborn our data visualization library. And we're gonna import matplotlib, the pyplot is PLT, which is used for uh, essentially a lot of visualization stuff as well. So let's import that first. And then we're gonna do something as that we've done in the past. We're gonna create something called a count plot. So let's do sns.countplot. And then we wanna specify what's in our count plot, right? So let's set our X value to be the final column. It's gonna be a lot clearer after we, I display what the count plot does, but we're gonna to have to label our X to be this. I'm just gonna copy that. So X equals this, and then you wanna specify where it's reading from, right? So you're gonna set data equals DF, right? Because we read all our data into this variable called DF from the CSV file, right? If you remember, if you go up a little bit, we read everything into DF over here. Okay, so let's run that. So you can see that we have like a little, uh, what looks like a histogram, kind of like a bar chart. And what we have here is we're essentially counting the number of malignant cells and the number of benign cells in our data set, right? So for zero, zero, zero stands for benign, right? That's just like our way of, of assigning our binary classification. We have zero for benign, one for malignant. It doesn't have to be that way. It's, it's absolutely, absolutely up to like the researcher or whoever like puts together that, the data, right? So for, for, for our case, we have zero to be benign and one to be malignant. And as you can see, we have, we have about, that's like what, 220 or 210 benign cells. And we have about 350, 350 malignant cells. 
So our data set is not, it's not very balanced, but it's, it's okay, right? Because ideally, like in a perfect, in the perfect world, you want the number of, uh, the number of uh, data points for this benign to match the number of data points for this malignant set. Because you want your data set to be as balanced as possible so that the neural network can learn evenly from, from everything. But over here, our data set is kind of skewed, but it's, it's not, it's not gonna make a big difference, at least in, with this data set, because we have enough points, right? So let's let's make another graph. Let's make a box plot. SNS dot box plot. And then we want to specify what goes into it. So our x data is going to be the same. Let me just copy paste this. Our x axis is going to be this. And we want to specify our y. So our y essentially, what, what, what the box plot does is it allows you to compare categorical data with with uh with regression data, if that makes any sense. So like, think like you have uh, data that is discrete and data that is uh, continuous, right? So we know that our benign, like this data over here, this column is discrete, right? So it's it's a yeah 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 it's discrete. It's either zero or one, right? If we go up back to our data set, this last column over here is this either zeros or one, right? But the, what we can do with the box plot is we can compare it to any other any other column where we you might think that we might have something interesting to look at over there, or uh, if there's like any kind of uh, continuous value, right? So like if we take worst area, for instance, the values here are continuous, right? Cause they're like, they're decimal values or like they're floating point numbers, right? So like it's 17 point something. It's always like some point something value, right? It's not just creep. So let, let's compare it to worst area. I think that's what I did. Okay, what I did in the, in the follow along is worst radius. So let's just stick with that, worst radius. And then we want to specify our data set, right? Because we've got to tell it where to get its data from. So data equals df, just like in this count plot. And let's run that. And you can see we have our little uh, our little uh, box plot over here. And we can see like there's kind of a like a difference between uh between these two categories, right? We we know we can from from this count plot we we can we can conclude that um, the the radius for the benign. The, the benign, uh, sorry, sorry for the for the malignant data data points. The the, the worst radius for the, for that set is a lot lower compared to the benign one, right? Because this box plot is a lot higher. The median is over here, and the quarter range is also like much higher compared to the malignant set. So there's a bunch of other like visualization stuff you can do. Let's do one more simple example, which is the scatter plot. So SNS dot scatter plot. And then what do we want to do? We want to set our X and Y variables. So for this one, we can literally set any two random to continuous values from, from, our, uh, from our 30 parameters, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set our X equals worst symmetry, symmetry, and our Y equals what I do in this mean texture, OK? Because you guys have probably used scatter plots before, we know that we only use scatter plots to, to uh, to plot to uh to uh continuous values and compare them, right? And then we got to specify where it's reading data from. So data equals df. Let's run that, and we can see that we have like a little scatter plot. There seems to be essentially no correlation in this. It's so like looking like as human beings, right? We can look at like a two uh, D graph like this, and we can we can say that there's no correlation in our data, at least like within two these two columns, right? But what's pretty cool is that the AI can look at all these thirty columns simultaneously and give us a correlation, right? So it's a pretty cool example, and yeah, that's basically that for the visual visualization part. So what we're gonna do next is we wanna start to split our data. Data splitting, split. Thing. And as you can see, like our, our data set, right? When we read it in, we have 569 rows by 31 columns, right? Where the 31st column is just the, uh, the labels for a data set, right? So what we want to do is we want to, one thing we want to do is we want to split this column, split this column from the main table, basically put it into its own table and keep the rest of the of the 30 parameters on its own table. Why do we do that? We do that because we know that these are the labels, right? The neural network is not gonna make predictions based on this, it's based on this column, 
right? It's only going to make predictions based on these 30, these 30 columns, right? So what we want to do is we want to split, firstly, we want to separate this into its own table and these guys into their own like singular tables. So you're going to have two tables, right? And let's start doing that. So we're going to create a new variable just called X, capital X. Be careful with that. We're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to do df, oops, should be small df, dot drop. And we want to set benign. Oh, I'm not going to try spelling it. I'll just copy paste from over here. And and we, we want to specify the axis. So what we're basically doing, I'll explain in a second. Give me, I'll just finish typing this, dot values. So what we're basically doing with this line is we're telling, let me just show the output. We're telling pandas or uh, Python to, to drop this column from the DF data set, right? Drop this column from the DF data set. And then what, why we're doing dot values is we, we don't want to put it into a table. We just want to take the array values or like the raw values. We, we, don't, we don't want it to be a table, right? If I move this dot values, if I run that, it's not, it's going to be in a table, right? Oh, wait, what happened? X, oh wait, this stuff glitches out sometimes. Let me just reload my data. Yeah, um, pandas can be very weird if you like try playing around with how you assign your data. I'm just going to rerun all my cells and we're going to see that it's gonna, oh, never mind. Yeah, it, it, what am I saying? Yeah, so you can see over here that the final column for benign and malignant is gone, right? It literally just like removes that column. But we're doing with this, like if we add dot values, we're basically assigning the values from this column into a new variable. So let's do that, run that. And we have like literally like the raw. 569 values in this really long array. It doesn't all look like 569 because there's a bunch of like triple dots in there, which show that there's like a lot more values in the set, right? And let's do the same thing for the Y set. Let's do Y equals DF. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna assign, um, just copy paste, that values. If you run Y, and if we run Y, we can you can basically see like the actual numerical uh, categorical categorical uh, values for whether it's cancerous or not, right? Remember before I said that one stands for a cancerous that like a cancerous a uh, cancerous a uh, tumor, and zero stands for benign tumor, right? So let me just go over this again. What this X data set is, it basically drops the final column and keeps the rest of the stuff, right? It drops this, this benign column or malignant column and keeps the rest of the data set, right? It drops all of this. And for the Y, what it does is we're essentially only storing the labels for each for each uh, data point, right? So we have all the 569 labels for, for, the, for the whole table. Right, so this is the first step. We essentially want to split these. I mean, the thing we can do is we can look at the shape, y dot shape. Oops, I cannot spell shape. Okay, and it tells us like the shape of this. It's five hundred sixty nine, and since like it's it's a one dimensional tensor or like a, ten, a tensor of rank one, it doesn't show anything. It's like the comma and it's just blank. Right, if it's two, it's going to show two, but when it's one, it just leaves it as blank for some reason. Just that's how uh, NumPy works. But yeah, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna import a library from scikit-learn. So what we wanna do is from sklearn dot model selection import train oops train test split. And what we're basically gonna be using this for is we're get we're gonna use this to split the data we created over here, the x and y data into a training set and a split set, sorry, and a, and a validation set, basically. As I mentioned before in our previous lectures, because I'm gonna go a little bit over that. So like, we essentially, we train the network on the training set and you can think of like the training set as the practice problems. 
And you can think of the, the validation set as the exam questions where it uses to try to evaluate, evaluate its own performance based on what it learns from the practice problem set. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so we're gonna do a couple things. We're gonna have to assign X train. We're basically doing a multiple assignment here, X test, then Y train, then Y test. And we're gonna set it equal to train test split. And then what train test split takes as input is it takes the X data which you created already. We already created like our capital X variable above, right? This is it. Which is the, uh, the 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 input questions, right? Or like the yeah. basically like not not the practice problem questions, but like the whole data set. Basically, like the the X the uh, the data set that the AI is going to use to make predictions as to whether it's benign or malignant, right? So. It's excluding this these labels, but it's including all the 30 columns over here. That's what our X is, right? So there's X, and then it takes another um, parameter, which is our Y, right? It should be small Y, oops, like uh, lowercase Y, and which is basically our, our labels, right? So it takes the, the 30 columns as well as the labels, right? But then what we want to do is we want to specify a parameter, which is called test size, also, you want to make sure, like, when you're spelling test size, you see spell the exact same way, same way, same way I'm spelling it, because that's how uh, this method or this uh, class identifies uh, this parameter. If if you misspell it, you can have an error. If you wanna, if you if you don't want to remember these stuff offhand, like as I said before in the previous tutorial, you can literally just like read the parameters in Google Colab, right? You can see this little table, and if you go down, we have like test size over here, right? So you want to spell it just as it is. Else you're gonna run into into a uh, into an error, right? So test size equals, and we're gonna set it to zero point two five, and what that means is we're gonna set twenty five percent of our whole data set to be our our exam questions, and we're gonna set the remaining seventy five percent to be our uh, our uh, practice questions. If that analogy makes sense, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the chat or mute your mic and. Ask me. Another last thing we're going to add is a random state. I'll explain what this does in a second, but a random state is essentially a random integer of, of our discretion. And what this does is essentially when, when, we, when we use this uh, split over here, if you're splitting 25% of, of our data set, it's going to randomly select 25% of our data points and, and set it to be our test or like our, our uh, final exam set or something or uh, whatever the analogy you want to use, right? So uh, since it's random, right, if we want to reproduce this over multiple computers, if I want to reproduce this on my computer and reproduce this on your computer, even though it's random in quotes, if you use if we use the same random state, we should have the same set for our test data set and the same set for our uh, train data set. I hope that makes sense. You don't necessarily have to do this. Like you, can, you can essentially like leave this, like remove this, uh, parameter, but it's just for reproducibility reasons across our computers in case we run into an error. So there's that. I'm going to run this. So let me just go across this line because it's pretty beefy. So we have four variables here. We're creating four new variables, right? We're getting one, two, three, and four, right? And why do we have four variables on the left side of the equal sign? Because this train test split outputs four variables, right? By default, it's gonna it's gonna spit out four variables. I think it says it somewhere in the description. Um, if if you read the examples, it's gonna like show you like how it works. But essentially, what we need to know that is it has four variables by default. That's just how the train test split um, function works from from a, a scalar, right? So what we need to do is we need to assign the variables in the right order, right? We need to assign our X train in the right order, our X test in the right order. Because like if, if we say, if we change the order of, of X test and X train, our whole, our whole data set is going to be messed up, right? Because scikit-learn outputs the data set in a very specific manner with regards to like how we, we specify the variables, right? So if you're coding this along with me, you want to make sure that the variables are arranged in the same exact sequence as mine, else you're going to run into problems in the future. So make, make sure that you have like X train, X test, Y train, then Y test, right? 
Hope that makes sense. Okay, so let's have a look at our X train. What we can do is X train dot shape to have an idea of how it looks like a shape. And it tells us the, the shape of uh, this matrix, right? So we have a 40, 426 by 30 by 30 matrix, right? Which is pretty large, right? We have 30 columns and uh, 426 rows, right? Because remember, we split some from data set. So we, we, no, we no longer have 569, we have 426 because 25% of the data set was split to be part of the X test. So let's look at the X test. X, I'm so sorry, I mean a uh, Y train, I bet. If you look at Y, is it Y train? Never mind, that should be X test. Yeah, yeah. X test is our, is our uh, final exam question sample. So we see that we have 143 and 426. And if we add these two, we should get a 560, 569 data points. So essentially, we took out 25% of our data set and put it into this new variable, which is the X test, right? Hope that makes sense. So that's it for uh, for just loading our data and splitting it. What we're going to look at next is our normalization. So data normalization. Jeez, I got to take an English class, but okay. So what is the, what is data normalization? If you remember in our previous tutorials, I mentioned that you don't necessarily have to normalize your data. So like, imagine you had like a range of data points for one column, say that one column ranges from, actually we can look, if we go all the way up to my description, I have like a very quick description of every single column. So let's look, let's, let's look at the radius column for instance, right? We know the minimum value in the uh, radius column is 6.9 and the maximum value is 28, right? So what normalizing does is it basically takes this whole range of values in that column and squishes them into a range of zero and one, right? So why do we do this? Why do we take a range of six or yeah, six to 28 and squish it between zero and one? Why do we need to do that? We do that because essentially, we, we, we're essentially giving the, the neural network or the AI a smaller range for it to predict its values. So like imagine if you had to predict a random number, right? Between six and 28. Like, and it's not just like integers, right? We're just, we're looking at floating point values, right? So the, the number of floating point values between 6.9 and 28 is a lot more compared to the floating point values between zero and one. I hope you agree with me. Like, I hope you see the logic behind that, right? Because zero and one, the range is just like one step, right? But from six to 28, it's like what? 22 steps, right? So there's a much larger range of floating point values that the AI can predict if you use this. So we, we basically want to, want to squeeze that range down to make the AI's job a lot easier. So like normalization, is, it's not something you have to do, like it's not a must do, but it's pretty, it's pretty common practice because it helps to reduce the amount of time that the training, like that training takes, right? Because like if, if you don't normalize your data, training can take like up to, uh, I don't know, like a few weeks perhaps, because like it's still trying to predict like within a much larger range. And remember it's doing it for every single column, right? So this is just this column the infinite number of floating, point, float, floating points between six and 28. But then remember we have 30, 30 different columns. So it's gonna have to do for this column, this column, this column, just look at this column for instance, it's between 143 and 2,501, right? That's a huge range, right? So if we squish that between zero and one, it's essentially gonna reduce drastically the amount of trading time we're gonna have to use for this data set. So that's why we do normalization and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and actually code it. Okay, so we're gonna have to import a library from sk learn dot processing, pre-processing, my bad. Import what is called min max scalar. This is essentially the tool that allows us to uh, automatically do all the uh, the normalization for for all the for all the thirty columns we have in our data set, right? All these columns. So we're gonna import that, run that, and then. Let's, we have to, the first step we have to do is we have to create an instance of, of the, we don't necessarily have to do this, but we're gonna create an instance of the of the, of the the tool, right? So scalar equals min max scalar, and it just creates like an, an empty instance, which allows us to, to, to use it later, right? So it's just literally just assigning it to a variable. It's nothing complex going on over there. You can just leave it as is like using this, but it's a lot easier to type scalar, right? 
So what we want to do as a first step is we want to do scalar, the variable we just created, dot fit, right? And we want to fit it. I'll explain what this fit does in a second. We're going to fit it on our x train variable that we created over here, right? We created x train over here from the train test split, right? And we're essentially going to fit it on this. So like, what does this mean? What does what this fit dot fit function do? So if, if we go back to a little, a little summary, if, if you want to view the summary on your site, it's on the, uh, the pre-coded document. So if you load up that document, you can see it in there. It's, it's all in there. But essentially what that dot fit does is it essentially learns all the ranges for all the 30 columns in our data set, right? Because we know the range from this data for this column is different from the range in this column and it's different from the range of this column. So what it, that dot fit does is it calculates it basically stores all the ranges for every single column over here. So for all the 30 columns, it's going to store all the ranges for that, right? Because we need the range to 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 uh to turn to normalize, right? If you guys uh, haven't really done normalization math, imagine say we had uh, let me just make a little comment. Imagine say we had a data set that goes between zero to 255, right? We know the minimum value is zero and the max value is 255, right? So if you wanted to normalize this data set, if you wanted to squeeze all the data sets, like all the, all the data points that exist between the range zero and 255, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to divide the whole data set by 255. Divide by, divide by 255, right? And why do we do that? If, if you want to do it, check it yourself, like the math checks out, right? Because the maximum value is 255, right? So if you divide the whole data set by 255, the maximum value is going to be one, right? And the minimum value is going to be zero, right? And if you say, if we had 254, it's going to be like 0 0.9999 something, right? So essentially what this does is as you divide the whole data set by 255, you're going to squeeze all the values between zero and one. I hope that makes sense. So essentially what this fit does is it calculates the range for every single one, because over here we, we have a simple range, right? We have zero to 255, so we know it's 255. But say if you had a range from this, uh, let me just make the, if you had a range from this to this, right? We'd have to essentially subtract this from this to find, to find the range, right? And divide the whole, the whole column by that range, right? So essentially what fit does is it automatically does all the subtraction stuff for, for all our 30 columns and it allows us to future use the, that range to normalize all, or all of our columns. I hope that makes sense. So right now what we've done is we've stored all the ranges, right? So now we, we have to proceed and normalize. So we're gonna normalize our X train. So we're gonna reassign X train to itself. So you're gonna do X train equals scalar, right? The transform. And what this transform does is it's, it's essentially takes the, the fit data that has already been stored, the range, and then it, it divides the whole column. It divides the whole column by uh, the range for, uh, for sorry, the, like all the single columns in x train because we know the x train itself contains 30 columns, right? It tells us the shape, it's 426 by 30, this little node, right? So it goes to the first column, divides it by the range it found in the fit function, goes to the second column, divides it by the range it found in the, in the fit function, and does it over and over and over again for the whole x train. Uh, data set, right? I hope that makes sense. And we're also going to do that for the x test, right? So let's set x test equals scalar dot transform. I cannot, I made a mistake, transform, yep. And we're going to have to put x test in there. Okay. And why are we just looking at x train and x test, right? Why don't we look at the y values? If you remember, like the y values are the predictions, right? Say if, if, if you're doing like a practice, I keep going back to this analogy for my favorite so far, but say say you're doing like a practice, a practice uh, set for your exam, right? The that X train is gonna be the practice set and the and the Y the, the Y train is gonna be the, the answers or the solutions to your practice test, right? So like we know that our solutions, we, we know if, if we have over here, like I, I printed the Y earlier, we know that our predictions are either zero or one, right? It's either malignant or it's benign, right? It's it's a binary classification, right? So we, we do not need to do any kind of normalization for this set, right? Because it's, it, it's either zero or one. There's no range of values between zero and one to try to predict. It's either zero or one, 
right? There's 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 nothing more to it. But then if if you look at the X train and X test data set, did I, did I print that before? Yeah, I think this is our yeah, this is X for instance, before we split it, I mean our X contains like a bunch of values, right? Which are not between zero and one and one, right? We have like two point something, we have a bunch of different values, right? So that's why we do not we did we do not perform the uh the normalization on the Y data set or like the the, the Y train and the Y test, but we perform it on the X train and the X test because those values are continuous values. Let me just make a little note. X data set is continuous. Continuous. So you guys don't forget. Y, I'm showing you a small Y data set is discrete. It's either malignant or it's benign, right? So let's run that. And yeah, that's basically it. If if I if I print X train for instance, uh, X train, I can literally just do X train dot max. And if I run this, oops, I'm going to add your brackets for the max. It essentially tells us the maximum value in X train, which is one, right? Which is what we're essentially trying to do, right? Because Initially, like our, our X train data set contains like 30 columns where like the maximum value is like some value in the thousands, right? And if you look at the dot min, oops, dot min, it's going to be zero or probably something close to zero. Yeah, zero. Yeah. So essentially, we've essentially squeezed, it's not the word squeezed our whole like data set between the range zero and one, right? So that's basically the whole point of this normalization part over here. So we can start getting in, into the interesting. Uh, Neural network architecture stuff. So let's make this architecture. Can I spell architecture? There's no H. Yeah. Architecture. Okay. Essentially, what what, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna we're gonna create we're gonna physically create like the layers of our neural network. Right. Let me just open up a new tab to remind you. A uh, new row. Network. And let's see. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna initialize an empty neural network, right? And we're gonna manually add every single layer. So you're gonna add, manually add the input layer. We're gonna manually add this hidden layer and basically like we're free to choose the number of hidden, hidden layers we want, right? So you're gonna add our hidden layers manually, manually and we're also gonna add our upper layer. So let's get into that. Where is my tab? There it is, okay. So we firstly need to import a few things. We're gonna to have to import TensorFlow, of course, which is our machine learning uh, data or library, STF. And next thing we need to do is from TensorFlow dot Keras dot models import sequential, just like in our last tutorial, right? Sequential. And next up, we wanna do from TensorFlow dot Keras the layers import. You're gonna import three things from here. You're gonna import dense, comma. You're gonna import activation, comma, and we also want to import dropout. Actually, we're not really gonna use dropout in it uh, in this tutorial, but just just import it anyway. It doesn't hurt. Uh, did I make a mistake? TensorFlow, oh wait, I think I'm supposed to run this first. Did I make a typo? Oh, the models, there should be an S here, yeah. You wanna make sure you type everything like properly or you're gonna run into errors. So tensorflow.carrots with models with an S and make sure your layer says an S as well. Let's run this. Should have no error this time, yep. Okay, no error, okay. So that's that, we've imported what the tools we need. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna initialize a new variable called model and model is essentially going to store our uh, neural network over here, right? So we're going to use a sequential, oops, sequential function that we imported over here, right? And what the sequential function does is essentially allows us to initialize an empty neural network. So if you imagine this page, we essentially end up like creating this whole thing, but with nothing in it, right? You can think of it like as a variable for holding all these layers to get all these layers together, right? So that's a necessary first step. We need to initialize. Right, so now we can start adding our our uh, our layers to it. So 
the syntax for that is model, right? Or empty neural network. We're gonna do model dot add, right? Which is pretty self-explanatory, right? We're gonna add to our empty neural network and we're gonna to have to add our layers, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start using this function over here, this dance function that we imported. So I'll explain what dance is in a bit in a minute. And essentially we're gonna have dense, we're gonna have units, which is essentially the number of neurons in that layer. So units equals, we can set like any number we want. So like, I'm gonna explain uh, how to select these numbers in the, like in the future. Actually like right after writing this line, but let me just finish this activation equals relu. Okay, so that's for this first line, right? So let me just explain. So what 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 is dense, right? What dense is, is uh, it's basically TensorFlow's way of representing a layer that literally looks like this, right? It's like a linear, it's like a, uh, you can think of it as a uh, vertical arrangement of, a, of, a, of a neurons to connect by, that are not connected together, right? Because you can see this neuron is not connected to this guy. They're like independent of each other, right? So we're, we're gonna create that initial layer. That's essentially what we're doing over here. So if you come back here, that's essentially what dance initializes and we put 30 units in it. So in this example, this image, we have four units, right? We have one, two, three, four. But for our purpose, we have 30 units. Why do we have 30 units? If you remember our data set, we have 30 different columns, right? 30 different columns we try to make predictions off because if you remember X train, X train is 426 by 30, right? So you, you want to make the input layer match the, the number of columns that exist for our, uh, for a table, right? And it makes a lot of sense, right? Cause like you can think of it as each column is gonna basically input its its values into a single neuron. So this neuron is gonna take input from the first column, this input, this neuron is gonna take input from the second column and so on and so forth, right? I hope that makes sense. And then activation, as I explained in a previous lecture is, or pre previous tutorial is that the activation function what it basically does is it takes in the weights and the inputs from uh, this uh, this uh, input, and then it applies some uh, some function that essentially you, you can you essentially think of it as a weighted sum of everything that goes into into this layer. So like it doesn't make a lot of sense if you we use the input layer to explain this. Let's look at this hidden layer too, for instance, right? We can see at this hidden layer too. Let me just enlarge in this image, uh, view image. Okay, so you can see this in this hidden layer two image, we have like one, two, three, four, five arrows coming into it, right? So what, what this activation function does is it essentially takes a weighted sum of all these arrows coming into this, into this neuron, right? So essentially you can think of it as it's summarizing all the inputs getting into, into this neuron. It's like try to, it's trying to reduce the amount of information has to process by, sim, by simply like, re, uh, um, summarizing it all into one function, which is the uh, activation function. So essentially, the activation function, the output is going to be a numeric value, right? It's going to range between, I think, negative one and, and one, right? Depending on the kind of activation function you're using. So relu, it's, it's a function. Let me just show you guys quickly. relu activation function. And it's essentially a function that ranges between zero and one. Let's see. Actually, yeah, on the y-axis, that's what you want to look at. Why this says actually no, it does not range from zero and one. So it's it's literally just a, a continuous range, which goes from zero and goes all the way up to infinity, right? So there's so many different kinds of activation functions. I'm not gonna get into into the the nitty gritty of like which one you should use. Um, if you want to know more about that, you can uh, probably ask me later, or uh, I can explain in a future lecture. But essentially, as a rule of thumb, usually you want to run the uh, the relu. The ReLU, uh, I didn't explain what this is. It's essentially a rectified linear unit. That's what ReLU stands for, rectified linear unit. And it's by, as, as a rule of thumb for your dense layers, you want to use uh, the ReLU activation function because it, it simply, it, it just works, right? Because it's it's simply like a, a linear, a linear, uh, a linear, uh, what do you call it? Function that it's, it's applying onto the inputs, right? There's a bunch more stuff. I'm going to, like, as, as we do more examples, we're going to see, like, or the different activation functions come in and why they're used in specific places. So that's it for the first layer. We can add a second layer. So what we're gonna do is we can literally just copy paste this line, copy and paste it below, right? And what we're essentially doing is we're adding another layer. So we can think of it as we added a, 
the input layer of 30. And then we're going to add another hidden layer or another uh, another uh, another layer uh, that comes that comes after this layer. And that layer is going to have 30 units as well, right? So you, you can kind of imagine this. So instead of having one, two, three, four, five in, over here, we have 30, right? And also, again, uh, this number, this number in particular, it does not need to match. It does not need to match the input or uh, uh, the number of columns for a data set, right? Because if you remember correctly, or if you remember, if, if you can back to this image, we have our input layer, right? Over here, we have four inputs, right? But in the hidden layer, the hidden layer, the number of neurons in this layer does not match the number of neurons in the input layer. Why is that, right? Why do we do that? We do that because we want our input layer to be able to take input from every single column, right? So we have to make the thing match. We have to make the uh, the units match the, the the column number for the first for the first layer. But then when it comes to the second layer, which is this guy over here, oh, what is it? This guy over here, right? We are free to to essentially select a value for this. We can select thirty. It's not going to hurt anything. We can select fifteen if we want to reduce our training time because we're going to have a uh, less uh, less connections, right? Because like imagine if you had a if you come back to this image, if you had like a lot more, uh, if you had a lot more neurons over here, it's going to be a lot more connections and a, and a, and a lot more uh, stuff for the neural network to process, right? So we can you can set thirty. Thirty is mostly you can have better performance over here, but then it's going to take more time to train. And depending on the data set you're dealing with, you might not have that luxury of time, right? So, so let's just deal with 15. So this is like one of the stuff, like as a machine learning engineer, you want to, like if, if say your, your neural network is not performing properly, this is one of the stuff you can tweak. You can increase the number of, of uh, neurons over here. You can make it like say 100 even, right? Or you can make it like five, right? And essentially this is all like experimental stuff. Like say you train your network and you notice that you have bad performance. You go like, hmm, okay. What if I add more neurons to the network? So instead of having five, say we have 15, if you still have bad performance, say you wanna make, you wanna improve your, your accuracy from like 50% to like, yeah, say like 90%, you might wanna add maybe like a hundred neurons, right? It's all like experimental. Like you wanna play with your data set and find out what works for uh, your, your data set that you're dealing with, right? So. We're gonna stick with 15 for now. We're gonna see how, how well that works in the future. And then, so for, for, for our case, we're only gonna have one hidden layer. In this example over here, we have two hidden layers, but we, we don't need to have two hidden layers, right? So essentially the number of hidden layers is also something that as a machine learning engineer, you, you have like the freedom to, to tweak because say if, if your, your network is performing badly, you can also decide to add more hidden layers to try to, uh, to, try to, uh, to make the neural network understand the dimension that the dimensionality of the uh the, of the uh data set right so like a good rule of thumb is like if we say like instead of if, if we had like say 100 columns instead right you most likely want to have like a few more layers because 100 columns is, is a lot of data for the neural network to process right but you're not really going to know right because it depends on say the number of roles you have and stuff like that so most of this stuff is highly experimental so say if we only we only keep this uh there's a uh, single hidden layer Right, this is a hidden layer, right? Let me just put some the Collins input layer. This is accepts input, right, from our data set. And over here is our hidden layer, which essentially tries to uh, draw some uh, correlations within from the input, right? What I say by correlations is if 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 we take this uh this uh this neuron, for instance, it's a hit. It's a hidden layer neuron, right? You can see that it's getting information from every single, every single uh, input neuron over here, right? So essentially, every single connection is going to have some some numerical weight weights attached to it, where the weight essentially signifies the importance of that connection, or like whether it's it's discovering something um, significant. So if we say we had a weight of one. That, that would be, or if, say we, we're dealing with, with ReLU, right? We, if we're dealing with the rectified linear unit. So if we say we had a weight of like 50, for instance, and we had another connection with a weight of like one, we know that the, the connection that has a weight of 50, it, 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 it's basically grasping some super important data that allows the neural network to make accurate predictions. And then the, the connection that has a weight of one, it's not nearly as important of, uh, it's, it's not nearly as important compared to the uh, connection that has a weight of 50. Hope that makes sense. Let's go back to this. So we have one input layer and one hidden layer, right? Let's go ahead and add our output layer. So we can, let's just copy this again. But then for output layer, 
you want to have one unit in the output. And you might be wondering, right? Like in, in our, let me just output layer to make it clear. Okay, so like in our previous tutorial, right? We made our output correspond to the number of categories, right? If you remember our previous tutorial, we had 10 categories, whether it was like a dog or a cat or like an airplane or like a tractor or whatever. We had 10 categories, right? Now let me just fix this. This should be sigmoid, which is another kind of activation function. So in that example, right, we had 10 different kinds of um, classifications, right? But in this example that we're dealing with, we have only two classifications, right? It's binary classifications. The, the tumor is, is either malignant or it's benign, right? It's one or the either. We don't have 10 different possibilities. We only have two possibilities, right? So if we use one neuron, what, what essentially happens is if the neuron activates to say to be like a value above zero, right? The, the network is going to predict that it's malignant. Or if, say, it predicts the value to be below zero, as the neural network might predict that to be a, uh, a benign tumor, right? So we only need one neuron for that, right? We don't need multiple neurons for, uh, for, this, for this purpose, right? Of course, you can like add more neurons. I need to do some research into like how like adding more neurons to this layer is going to affect the predictions. But yeah, like the minimum number you need is one if you want to have like good predictions for now. I'll look into like how adding more neurons because like we have just like two predictions, right? So what if we had like 50 over here? I'd have to uh, get back to you guys on that and how that actually affects the uh, the training. Okay, so that's that's essentially our model architecture. So uh, if I had paint, it's gonna be super messy because I'm using a mouse, but you can essentially visualize something like this where we have our input layer, which is 30, right? 30 units on our input. So instead of having one, two, three, four, we have 30, right? And then we go to our hidden layer, which is this guy over here, and we have 15 units, right? So you can think of it as this guy, hidden layer one, and we have 15 units over here. We do not have a hidden layer two because we just don't want to have add it yet, right? We could add it in the future if you want to, if you want to try to improve the performance for a network, but for now, we're not going to add that. And our output layer, if you remember, we have one unit over here, right? And which is in, instead of three, we have one, right? And then I explain why we have that. I'm gonna touch on what the sigmoid function is for a sec. So let me just look that up. Sigmoid to help you guys understand. You've probably seen this stuff in like statistics before, but essentially, remember I, I, I mentioned that the values can either be uh, between uh, the values on the Y axis, right? That's what we care about. It's either between negative one and one, right? So, how, how this is going to work with our single neuron is if, say, the value is below zero, right? If the value is negative, the neural network might predict the, the, uh, the, 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 the tumor to be malignant, right? And if it's below, sorry, if, if it's above zero, if, if it's a positive value, it might predict it to be uh, benign, right? So like, that's like a little like binary classification going on over here, where like the X value over here is, the, is essentially the input from these connections, like the essentially the... the uh, the, the weighted sum of all these connections and it essentially applies that weighted sum on the x-axis and based on its uh, corresponding value on the y-axis, it's gonna give us a classification. It might sound like a lot to wrap your head around, but don't worry, we're gonna do a lot of examples so that you guys fully understand everything in the future. But yeah, so you're gonna keep in mind for uh, binary classifications, we wanna use a sigmoid function and one unit, at least for uh, in my experience. Okay, so that's it for the architecture. Now we want to, so yeah, that's not it for architecture. We have one more thing to add. We, we want to compile our model, right? Now, what does this compilation mean? I'm going to get into that for, in a second. But what we, we want to do is we're going to do model.compile. What's the time? Uh, model.compile. And then we're going to set loss equals, I'll explain what this does in a second, binary cross entropy, right? And then we want to set our optimizer to be Adam. If you remember from, from our previous tutorials, we've used the Adam optimizer before. As I explained before, what this optimizer does is it helps with the back propagation process where like it tries to it tries to modify the weights of every single connection over and over and over again until there's a good or there's a good accuracy or there's a good prediction, right? 
So essentially what the optimizer does, it, it helps to uh, edit the weights of every single connection. And what this loss function is, it's a binary cross entropy fu function. It's a very specific uh, function. If you look it up, binary cross entropy formula, it's a very specific function, which uh, we, we essentially use if we, if you're trying to use a binary classification, right? And you might be wondering, like, why do we need to use binary cross entropy? It's essentially just a, I do not know the full reasoning behind it because there's a lot of calculations and math that goes into it. But what, what you need to know is, like, it, if you're dealing with a uh, binary classification, if you're trying to predict, like, a dog versus a cat, or, like, say, in our case, we're trying to predict a uh, malignant tumor over a, uh, a benign tumor, that, that's either zero or one, right? Malignant or benign. You want to use a binary cross entropy function because it, it excels at calculation at calculating the 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 loss, like an accurate loss to 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 uh, to depict the performance of, of our network, right? You can use other loss functions, like you could use MSC, you could use RMS prop as you've used in the past, but binary cross entropy and uh, has the uh, has the best performance, at least in in research papers. So we're going to use that. And what else is there? Okay, so we can run that. Mm, okay, we're gonna be done super soon. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna train the AI, right? So we're ready to train everything, model uh, training. And before I actually do this, let's, uh, if you're coding along with me, you're gonna go into your runtime and go into, uh, change runtime type and set it to be GPU because it's going to greatly uh, accelerate the, the training the training time. So you got to click GPU, click save. But then when you do that, it basically resets the whole notebook. So you want to, when it's done with this, after it says connected and it shows your RAM and disk, you want to go to runtime and click run all. Or like, yeah, run all. Or... Yeah, if, if, if you do that, it's going to, so how a uh, collab works is that when you restart the uh, the kernel, it, it clears all, all your data that you've, you've uploaded. So you want to manually re-upload the data, the, uh, the the CSV data thing, because they cannot find it, right? So you got to drag it back into over here, let it upload, and we want to, uh, where's run time, run all, and it should work. You go to wait to the bottom. And yeah, so essentially the, the reason we do this is we're gonna have fast training with our neural network. Okay, so we should be done this in like 10 minutes. So getting a bit more time. Okay, so essentially we, we're gonna have to train our model, right? So we're gonna, the syntax for that is model.fit, right? And there's a few parameters for fitting our model. You can think of it as like, yeah, fitting like, fitting like a curve kind of, but instead of fitting it to, to like an like to a 2D curve, we're trying to fit like a 30 dimensional curve, which is pretty cool, right? So you want to specify what our X data on that curve is, right? And our X data, if you remember, is our X ray data set, right? And then you want to specify what our Y data is, right? So Y equals Y train, right? And then we also want to specify our epochs, right? And let me explain what epochs are. I think I've done this in the past, but let me just specify this, right? So what the epochs are is essentially, we know that our training data set has about 400 points in it, right? If you go up here, it has, if we did, we run train.shape over here, it has 426, right? So what the neural network is gonna do is, it's gonna make a prediction for every single row in the 426 rows, right? And after it makes a, a prediction for every single row, it's gonna look back and be like, hmm, what can I do better? And it's gonna make, it's gonna make a new set of predictions for the whole set of roles, right? So you can think of it as a, as a huge batch of twenty of uh, 426 roles. And then the neural network does this 600 times, essentially we telling it to do it 600 times over and over and over again until the predictions are correct, right? You can think of it as a human being trying to attend the same practice problem over and over and over again until it, it, it understands what the practice problem is. Except that that's probably not gonna work for a human being, but it works for AI. So. That's for epoch. I think it should be yeah, epochs with an S. Make sure you have the S over there. And then we're gonna have a couple more parameters. We're gonna have validation. Actually, do you need to have this? Yeah, let's just keep it. Validation. 
data equals, and we put in a tuple, right? A tuple of our validation stuff, just x test, which we created before, and y test. Oops, let me, y test, right? And oops, what happened? Okay. And then essentially, this we're essentially putting in a tuple of what the exam questions are and what the exam answers are. So it, it tries to evaluate itself on the exam as it's training on the uh, on the practice questions. And then we're going to set verbose equals one. This you don't need to have this. Is what this does it essentially shows like the output for uh, the output as it trains, right? So if we run this, our neural network should start training. Hopefully you don't get any errors, if any typos and stuff. Let's see. Yep. Um, let's see. Okay. Oh, it's training. Okay. So as we can see, let me just close this side. So you can see that it's it's looping through epochs. So far, it's on the 162nd epoch, and she's moving pretty fast, right? It's gonna hit 600 pretty soon, and it's gonna stop training. And as I explained before, what this epoch is, a single epoch is where it goes through the whole training set, and it makes a prediction for every single role in that set. And then after, after making that those predictions, it's going to look back and be like, OK, how wrong was I from the real answer? And it's going to calculate the loss. And it's going to do something called back propagation. And it tries to make it, it essentially edits the weights for the connections and tries to uh, make the weights in such a way that it's going to mimic or like be as close as possible to the real answer, right? So it's already done trading, right? It's six, 600 out of 600. And our loss is 0 0.2. And if we go all the way up, if it's probably going to be okay. I'm not going to scroll 600, but yeah, um, don't worry about loss for now. I'm going to plot it, so it's going to be a lot easier for you to, for you guys to uh to see. Let me do this quickly. Um, okay, so one thing we're going to do is we're going to plot everything. Uh, let's plot our loss model. Loss. I'm going to create a new variable equals pd the data frame and we're going to input model dot history dot history if you remember from previous tutorials this is basically how to access the uh, the uh, the loss functions and everything this essentially tells us how well our thing is performing so let's let's run that and we can do model underscore loss dot plot And essentially, you can see over time, we're going to focus on the, the blue one for now. Over time, you can see that it gets better and better at performing on the uh, the blue line, which is for the line for the practice questions, right? So the lower the value, the, the, the better the performance, right? So for the practice questions, it essentially did a really good job at answering the practice questions, right? But if you look at the, what you call this, the uh, the exam questions, right? That's the, the validation loss or the uh, the exam set. You can see that it does a pretty okay job as well, but you can see that the value starts going up, right? The val the average value for this sort of goes up over time, right? But then we shouldn't be too concerned, right? Because if you look at the scale on the y-axis, this is within a scale of like 0 0.1 or so, like 0 0.2, right? If you compare like how different this is. And like in extreme cases, you're gonna have something called overfitting where you're gonna have like say this guy going all the way up to like infinity and like this guy staying down all the way down to zero, that's a really bad case. And I'm gonna, the future, gonna look at how to deal with that. Okay. So let, let's finally wrap this tutorial and look at how well, well our model is performing on our data set, right? So we wanna essentially have this line over here predictions, which is a new variable. And we're gonna have predictions equal model.predict classes. And what this predict classes does is it predicts the, the classes for the exam test is essentially tries to predict whether the exam questions are either malignant or benign, right? So let's run that. And it's going to give you a little warning. Don't worry about that warning. It's just a deprecation thing. And then we can, what we can do is we need to import something first. We need to import. Let's do this quickly from SK. Learn dot metrics import confusion matrix sounds pretty daunting at first but don't worry i'm gonna explain what it is uh let's import confusion matrix and uh we're gonna essentially use confusion matrix to help us analyze our, our metrics so we're gonna 
print. Wait, is that the right thing? Actually, no, not confusion matrix, classification. Should have confusion matrix actually. I don't know. Let's let's do classification matrix, so a classification report instead. It gives us a classification report. It gives us a lot more information for now. So, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna print out the output from this classification re report for our uh, for our data or or predictions, right? So we're gonna have to call classification classification. I guess it's not there, class. I guess because I didn't run this. Let me just run this. Yep, classification report. And then we, we want to apply classification report on. What we're going to do is we're going to apply it on our Y test, right? And our predictions. So what am I doing over here, right? Predictions. So we made predictions, right? We made predictions on X test a data set that it did not train on, right? It did not perform backpropagation on X test. It only performed backpropagation and training on X train, right? X test is a practice questions. You can assume that you've never seen X test questions before, right? You've never seen it in your entire life. So what the neural network is gonna do is it's gonna attempt to answer these questions, right? And it's, it's a pretty fair assessment if you think about it, right? Cause it's a bunch of questions never seen before. So we can't say that it literally just stored all the all the information for this stuff it's generally trying to to make predictions based on what what it learns from the practice problem set right so what we're going to do over here is you're going to print this and it's going to basically compare the real predictions because we, we we know what the correct answers are right we know what the correct answers are for x test right and the correct answer for x test is y test right if you remember correct answer for x test x test is the practice as the uh, sorry is the exam question set and Y test is the exam solution set. So what we're essentially doing is we're comparing the exam solutions, which is Y test, to our own solutions, which are our predictions, right? So let's run that. And as you can see, there's a bunch of like random uh, metrics over here. Don't worry about this. You've probably heard of this if you've taken like st statistics classes, but what we're, what we're really concerned for our purposes is our accuracy, right? So accuracy, if we just call them, we have a 0.92 accuracy, which is 92% accuracy on our uh, exam test, right? So after doing all of this, we've, we've basically been able to train our neural network to make predictions on a 30 dimensional data set up to a 92% accuracy, which is pretty crazy if you think about it, right? We could, there are ways we could take this up to like 98, but if we don't need to worry about that for now, we'll probably look at that in the future, in the future because basically over time now but yeah that's essentially it our main goal is to maximize our accuracy and we've done that we've been able to train our whole neural network to make predictions up to 0.92 we could essentially run this on our own data points but mind that our our, our table has 30 parameters so we'd have to manually create like a variable that has 30 individual parameters just like a lot of work right we, we don't need to go, go all the way and do that we can literally just look at this look at the accuracy it already has like parameters and stuff for the X test data set and it makes predictions off that. Hope that makes sense. And if there are any, oh, there's a question. Uh, uh, I just wonder uh, what's the difference between this accuracy uh, 0 0.92? Uh, was the, uh, can you screw up a little bit for the, yep. the for the, yeah, for this. Uh, oh, loss, okay. That's a really good question. That's a really yeah. good question. Okay. There, you so, have this orange line, uh, which also indicates the let's say uh, the performance on the on the final yeah, exam. So on the right. yeah, why why test? Yeah, what's the difference? Yeah. Like I think these values are very close, but yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. So these values are actually very close. But then what the loss is, if you remember, if you go all the way up to a neural network, we specified our loss, right? Our loss function is essentially this binary cost entropy function, which we looked up over here. So it does this like this fancy math on it for the whole data set and it computes the the output for every single epoch, right? So if you come back over here, well this epoch, if you take like a random epoch, epoch 256, 262, for instance, we know that the loss for this one is 0 0.02, 0 0.02, and the validation loss is 0 0.2, right? 
So essentially, the main goal of the neural network, like it doesn't, the neural network does not know what accuracy is. It's never met accuracy in its entire life. All it knows is loss, right? So the loss only is it's available to neural network. And when the neural network receives a loss after, say, this epoch, it's like, hmm, okay, I have this amount of loss. Or like it says, I have this, actually, we're not even looking at this, right? This is just for our own personal purposes. It says I have this amount of loss, right? And what's, what it's going to do is it's going to try to minimize this loss to help improve improve performance, right? Because if you remember from our my initial explanation, uh, if I just look at our regular loss function, right? A regular loss function. Uh, let me just look at MSC. It's a lot easier to explain with the MSC loss function. Where the MSC loss function essentially compares it takes the, the difference between the real value and the, and the expected value, right? And it's, it's just squares. So like, it's just like the, uh, the square difference of the, uh, of, the, of the real value of like the exam real solution set and your answer to the exam, right? So essentially what the neural network does is it calculates how far off it is. It calculates how far off it is from uh, the real answer, right? And then it tries to, it tries to make, it tries to essentially minimize the loss, right? So in a perfect case, you can have these two values equal to each other, right? And if these two values are equal to each other, the MSC or the, the error is gonna be zero, right? Because one minus one, for instance, is gonna give you zero square, which is always zero, right? So in a perfect scenario, you wanna make the loss as close to zero as possible, right? But like, that's, that's in a perfect scenario, right? It's, it's not gonna, it's most likely not gonna happen, but we're pretty close, right? We have 0 0.03, like we have numbers which, which are pretty close, right? That's, that's essentially what, what the loss is. It essentially compares the real answer to its own prediction and calculates how far off it is. And for accuracy, right? Accuracy is essentially our, our own metric where after the neural network is done training, we run it on the, we, we, we run it on a set of questions it's never seen before, right? So it tries to evaluate a new set of questions and then we manually calculate our accuracy, right? Because you know accuracy is simply like the number of correct answers divided by the, to the total number of answers we give, right? I hope that makes sense. So like it's, it's our own metric. The neural network literally does not know what accuracy is. It only makes its decisions based on laws. But for accuracy, accuracy is essentially, it's, they're very closely related because the lower your loss, the higher your accuracy, right? Because uh, to be particular with this, the lower your validation loss, the, the higher your accuracy, right? So essentially, you, what losses is, or validation losses, you're trying to minimize the difference between your answer and the real answer. What accuracy is, it essentially calculates it for the whole data set and gives you a percentage about which ones it got correct and which ones it got wrong, right? So over here, for 92% of our data points, it, it got them correct. And for 8%, it got them wrong. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Are there any more questions? Rainis, do you have anything to add? No, I think that's good. Okay. Great. Thank you guys for coming out today. It was a, uh, it went a bit longer than I thought, but yeah, I hope you guys understood everything and we're going to be looking at more examples, most likely after reading week, right, Arrhenius? Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, so we'll keep you updated on our, on our socials. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.